wonderful piece. Uh, I want to say uh, again uh, a welcome to our group uh, that's here. These folks are from literally all over the world. Uh, there was one person from the Vatican, um, a couple that are from Australia, uh, a few from uh, all over the United States, and somebody leaned over to me earlier and said, how come the one from the Vatican doesn't have one of those big hats on? And um, I said, well, why don't you go ask them that? I don't know. But I think that person had to leave uh, this morning, I was told. So maybe that's why they don't have the hat on, right? But we are thrilled to have you all here and uh, to have you in Nashville, to have you in Woodmont. And I'm um, just thankful that uh, it worked out for you to come and worship with us here today. Um, every new year, uh, when we begin the month of January, we pick three focus areas at our church to lift up during the new year and I want to take just a moment before the sermon this morning and share what those three are going to be for the year 2014. The first focus area that we're going to have is small groups. Uh, we continue to uh, believe in the importance of small groups uh, within the life of our church and a church the size of Woodmont's uh, needs small groups to stay healthy and uh, we all need that for education, for fellowship, for accountability, for mission opportunities and also for spiritual growth. And part of our goal this year will be to start new small groups and to get some of our newer members uh, plugged into those small groups in the, in the coming weeks and months. And we're always looking for leaders, folks that want to start a new small group, lead a new small group. And if you look in your bulletin this morning, there is a little brown card uh, that if you would take a moment and fill that out, you can put that in the offering plate uh, with just a couple of different options. Let us know. Are you in a small group? Would you like to be? Would you like to be a leader? Uh, you can say thank you, but no thank you, and that will help us to know that uh, that's not something you're open to right now. So we would appreciate you filling that out. The second focus area for 2014 is stewardship. And I'll have your, want you to remember that stewardship is not just about money. Of course, we need financial resources to do the mission and ministry here at Woodmont, but stewardship is about time, talent, and treasure. And we want to have conversations about how we're spending our time and are we using our spiritual gifts to lead and to give back to this community and, uh, and to, uh, to this world. And so uh, the discipleship classes that begin this Wednesday night will help with that, but stewardship is our second area of focus. And lastly, uh, strategic planning. Uh, for about five months now, Cyril Stewart and I have worked with a group that's been focused on strategic planning, and uh, we are seeking the input of the congregation, asking the question, what is God calling our church to be and to do next? And I hope you'll come and join us for that breakfast on February uh, the 1st. Now, would you please join with me uh, for a word of prayer. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Something I did in the, t in the year 2013, and I'm still trying to figure out if it was a good idea or not, was to join Twitter. I joined Twitter, and I'll tell you that for a minister, I have an embarrassingly low number of followers on Twitter, <laughs> which has taught me humility uh, over the, the past six or seven months. But Twitter is interesting because you get information and updates on all kinds of things, and uh, the only problem with Twitter is that it be can become addicting. Uh, people have a hard time putting that phone down and not checking it all the time. Uh, but about a week and a half ago, somebody posted something on Twitter that I found fascinating, and the title of it was, Hello, My Name is Church, and I want to share it with you this morning. Hello, my name is Church. I'm sure you've heard a lot about me. I have no shortage of critics. Perhaps you've heard that I am boring, shallow, cheap, a waste of time. You've heard that I'm full of hypocrites, clowns, greedy people, the self-righteous, Maybe you visited me before and discovered horrible music, passionless singing, dry preaching, rude congregants. Maybe you needed me and I was too busy, too righteous, too broke, too blind. Maybe you joined me and found that I was distant, demanding, dull, preoccupied. Maybe you tried to serve in me but were caught off guard by business meetings, committees, teams, bureaucracy. Maybe you left and were surprised that nobody called cared, noticed, invited you back. Perhaps your experience has driven you to speak negatively of me, swear to never come back to me, proclaim that no one needs me, believe you're better off without me. 
If this is true, I have something to say to you. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I blew it. I made a huge mistake. But remember, I never said that my name was perfect, flawless, complete, arrived. My name is Church. I welcome the hypocrite, the dry, the self-righteous, the shallow. I welcome the sincere, passionate, forgiving, and selfless. I cannot shut my doors to the people who make you angry, uncomfortable, impatient, self-conscious. So why not come back to church and let all of these messed up people challenge you, sharpen you, strengthen you, humble you? I can't promise that the people will be great. This is church. It's not heaven, paradise, the promised land, the celestial city. Come back. God wants you here. The body needs you here. The world needs your witness here. You belong here. Hello, my name is Church. I miss you. I love you. I'm sorry. I can't wait to see you. As we continue this January series called Back to the Basics, and as we journey through the, the Gospel of Matthew, I have one question for you this morning that I want to pose and have you reflect upon it. And I'd love to hear the response of our guests at our luncheon today. But the question is, what do you think Jesus would say about Christians? Now, of course, you could follow up that question with, well, which Christians are you talking about? There are all kinds of Christians out there, but do you think that Jesus would agree with all of the things that some Christians think are so important? We've heard a, a few different scriptures this morning from Matthew's gospel. First, the lectionary text, Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, the one who had prepared the way for his coming. And remember, John was always pointing away from himself and to Christ, a reminder of what we too are called to do. And when Jesus comes up out of the water, Matthew tells us that the, the heavens were opened up and a voice came down saying, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This marks the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And when we get baptized, it marks the beginning of our ministry and our journey as Christians, a journey that is lifelong. Karen Wiseman, who is a professor of homiletics at Lutheran Seminary, says this, in the waters of baptism, we are connected to God, to our community, and to all of salvation history. In the waters of baptism, we are infused with the Spirit to do God's will. Jesus submitted himself to baptism despite the fact that he was sinless according to most traditions. He was embodying a behavior he would latter command his followers to do as they took up his cross to follow him. Baptism is an important sacrament in the life of the church. For many, it is a cleansing of sins. For others, it is an entry right into membership in the community of faith. And for others still, it is a dying to sin and a rising in faith and in righteousness. Then we heard a passage from the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 7 this morning where Jesus talks about judgment and he says, judge not so that you may not be judged. The judgment you give will be the judgment you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? You see, Christians are really good at figuring out what's wrong with everybody else. I can tell you what your shortcomings are. I can tell you where you fall short. I can tell you what I don't like about you and your lifestyle. I can tell you what you need to do differently. But we have a much more difficult time looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. I screwed that up. I dropped the ball. I need to work on that. We have a hard time owning up to our own mistakes and our own character flaws. And Jesus was aware of that. And so he said, take the log out of your own eye, 
before you go and try to remove the speck out of your neighbor's eye. When we're very judgmental in life, what does it accomplish? Somebody once said, if you have one finger pointing towards somebody else, there are three fingers pointing back at the source of most of your problems. The third passage that Pharaoh read this morning from Matthew 16, where Jesus is talking about the essence of Christianity, which is the cross and self-denial. He says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? And we will all acknowledge that we do live in a world where many people, including many Christians, are extremely selfish and self-centered. They are narcissistic and only concerned about themselves and their own well-being. And you know what? I was thinking about that this week, and I don't think that it's always intentional. I think that life is busy. I think that it's hard. We have a lot of responsibilities, and we all get wrapped up in our own little worlds But we are all guilty of forgetting that the essence of the Christian faith is love and sacrifice and service to others. It is to deny self as much as possible, and it's not easy. Because Christ does not affirm the values of this world. He challenges them. He stands in contrast to them. He turns them upside down. And something else that he did on a regular basis was he challenged the religious establishment of his day. And I think he would still do the same today. So what do you think? Would Jesus recognize Christians? Would he claim us? Would he be proud of us? Would he say to us, you are my son or my daughter, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. If he spent a week with you, what do you think he would say? There are two books that have had a, well, a number of books, but two in particular that I've really enjoyed over the past couple years. The first was Harvey Cox's book, The Future of Faith. And in that book, Harvey Cox breaks the history of Christianity down into three basic categories. From the time of Jesus until the time of Emperor Constantine, he called that the Age of Faith where people were very uh, interested in in following uh, Jesus' example and teachings. And then with Constantine's conversion to Christianity, from that time until the middle of the 20th century, Cox says that we entered what he called the age of belief, where people are very concerned with uh, correct beliefs and doctrines and what we're supposed to believe. Well, now, Cox says, from the middle of the 20th century until now, we've entered the age of the Spirit. And he says that people are much less concerned with what you believe and the the things that you can recite and more with how does having an authentic Christian faith change your life on a daily basis. That book was very eye-opening for me. Another book that I came across was one by Henry Nouwen called Life of the Beloved. And in that book, Nouwen says, it's sad to see that in our highly competitive culture and greedy world, We have lost touch with the joy of giving. We often live as if our happiness depended on having, but I don't know anyone who is really happy because of what he or she has. True joy and happiness and inner peace comes from the giving of ourselves to others. A happy life, now and says, is a life lived for others. There's another book that the elders and the staff are reading right now, written by Rubel Shelley. And this book has got an interesting title. The title is, I knew Jesus before he was a Christian, and I liked him better then. But in that book, Shelley says, Jesus is an appealing, wonderful presence in the world. 
He brings hope and healing into broken lives. He gives sight to the blind and hearing to deaf ears. He brings lepers out of quarantine and back to their families, sinners out of banishment and back into the community. He tells the people to whom nobody else will give the time of day that the kingdom of God belongs to them. But then Shelley says this, And yet that Jesus was so out of step with the religious establishment of his time that they murdered him and have done so time and time again across church history to keep him from turning the masses away from their authority and buildings and rules and regulations and tithes and offerings and other trappings of institutionalized religion. When we get baptized, we're not just making a commitment to an institution. We're making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And then we live out that commitment in the community of the church. And that commitment is the beginning of a journey that will be wild and challenging and difficult and frustrating and full of ups and downs. We'll encounter people that drive us absolutely crazy, that push us to our wits end, but it's worth it. It's always worth it. Later in the book, Shelley says, the church is not buildings and property. It's not religious assemblies and ceremonies, it's not alignment with certain social causes and political parties. The church is a community of redeemed people in the process of daily surrender to God's rule. The church is a distinctive way of life being modeled by the already Christians to the not yet Christians. The church must indeed be the message it wishes a watchful world to hear and to embrace. The church is Christ's second incarnation in the world. And that's actually a part of the problem because the world sees a disconnect between Jesus and what he said and did and taught and believed and what the people who claim to be his followers often say and do. The world doesn't understand why people who claim to follow Jesus have such a hard time with love and compassion and forgiveness and unity. And every time we come to the table, we should remember that. We should be challenged by that. So what would Jesus say about Christians? What would he say about us? Sure, it might depend on the day. We have our good days and our bad days, days when we're proud of how we've acted and days when we're not. But would he claim us? Would he be proud of us? What would he tell us that we need to do better. 